and welcome to the Football Hipsters podcast, The Interviews. Dun, dun, dun. I am your host, Chris, and uh, during this international break, we thought we would spoil you good listeners with a couple of interviews. If you haven't heard it already, by the time you're listening to this, uh, Tom's interview with uh, John Driscoll of uh, Sky Sports Spanish football coverage fame uh, should be available. So please do give that a listen if you're into your Spanish football. But if you're tuned into this podcast, I would imagine you're into your English football and specifically your uh, your lower league English football. But when I say lower league, I don't mean the dregs. I mean the uh, anything below the Premier League, because uh, unlike most people, we do remember that football was not invented in 1992. Now, who better to join me for this uh, trip down the lane of Championship League One, League Two football, uh, but our very own expert. I should call him an expert because he is. It's Mr. Ross Bramble. Good evening, Ross. Oh, thank you. Good evening, sir. That's all right. Uh, I've called you an expert now, so that means that you have to get every single thing factually correct as of now. Yeah, that's the, the uh, funny thing is that when, when I started doing the English breakfast, I was peddled as the, the, the championship expert. And I think I've done all right since then. I predicted Hull going up. And I've listened back to the to the preview pod. I think between us, we did quite well. So That's good, then, I would suggest. If, if you're getting things right then we can justify you as an expert. But of course, as in with the English media, if you do get anything wrong, you're immediately an idiot. So as long as you're cool with that, then that's fine. We can work with this. Yeah, all right then. <laughs> I am, of course, joking. So uh, thank you very much for your time this evening. We we wanted to do this pod because uh, obviously you have a lot of knowledge of the championship and all things sort of in the lower leagues. Um, and championship is your the thing you love the most of all the leagues and the thing you like to talk about. Um, and for all of our listeners who might be tuning into this pod for the first time, may have just found us, we do a little show, don't we, on, uh, on a Sunday night. Do you want to tell our listeners about what we do on a Sunday evening each week? Uh, we sit down and we talk nonsense about the Premier League and the Championship, really, and League One and League Two, of course, as well, but uh, predominantly the, champ- the Championship and, and the Premier League weekend action. It's uh, called The English Breakfast, I do think. Absolutely, yes, The English Breakfast podcast. So uh, we are predominantly, as the Football Hipsters podcast, we do like to cover our European football on the main pod, but we, we look after our English uh, our English comrades, or, or indeed people who just follow English football. So if you haven't listened already, do uh, listen to our other pods. Right, uh, that's enough waffling from me, Ross. Let's get straight into the meat of the action. And uh, we're going to start in the Championship and then um, sort of have a little touch on the lower leagues uh, when we finished there. So Championship football then. Fair to say it's been quite the start to the to the championship before we dissect some teams individually what's uh, what's kind of caught your eye what's uh, what's surprised you what's excited you how are you feeling about this season so far oh, I'm loving the season so far um you look at the current championship table which as Chris says we'll go through in a minute so no spoilers but you look at the current championship table and it almost looks like it's inversed you know, there's there's teams near the bottom that we'd all expect to have been near the top. There's teams at the top that should be nowhere near the top. It, it's already been absolutely fantastic. Some amazing games already. Um, Newcastle Norwich from a couple of weeks ago stands out and some absolutely incredible goals already. 11 games in and this is already shaping up to be a, a really, really fun season of Championship football. So loving it early doors. It's plenty to discuss, plenty to get our teeth into and get our teeth in. We shall. Um, shall we start at the top? Because there's a surprise leader in the championship we're uh, we should say to our listeners who who aren't maybe au fait with the championship we are 11 games in um it is a league that's comprised of 24 teams two going up automatically and the four places below that have a playoff situation at the end of the season um now huddersfield town ross uh, top of the championship as we speak they've got 25 points for their 11 games they've got Jurgen klopp's best mate as their manager um, they did a very bizarre pre-season which involved uh, camping in the middle of nowhere i believe uh, very blair witch uh, it's very topical what what do you think is is going right for them and what what have you made of them in the bits you've seen so far this season uh well i have to be honest i haven't seen a great deal of them across 90 minutes um I do love the championship, but one of the problems with it is that you only get one or two games a weekend, and often it's focused on like the, the biggest names in the championship. So unfortunately, I haven't actually seen a full 90 minutes of Huddersfield, which is very, very frustrating. But um, it's just the most incredible story. If they go up, which at the moment, you would be hard-pressed to see them not. Um, if they do go up, it's the Leicester City story of the championship, because this was a team that was expected mid-table, perhaps a little bit lower. Um, Dave Wagner came in midway through last season. Like you say... Um, 
Jürgen Klopp's apprentice from from Dortmund. He was his best man at his wedding. He knows Klopp very, very well. Um, very, very similar styles. They've even called Huddersfield Baby Liverpool because they they've adopted the same gig and pressing style. They've loaned in all these um, these foreign talents, and it, it's extremely impressive that it's doing as well as it already is. Um, Eleven games in, like you say, twenty five points. Absolutely fantastic from where we thought they were going to be at the start of the season. Because I remember on, on the preview pod, I said. I was a bit worried that they were becoming a bit of a mercenarial team with, with all the loans and the, 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 the foreign players they were bringing in from this country and that country. But like you say, they, they did this weird camping trip. I think it was in Sweden they, they went off to um, and they spent a couple of nights under the stars getting to know each other. And I don't know, it, it seems to have bonded them. They've done brilliantly. And you, you look at the, the goals for and against, 14 scored, 8 conceded. 14 isn't massive for the championship. But at the same time, eight conceded already. That's that's pretty good going for the championship because goals fly in everywhere. So it's it's almost like Dave Wagner has got Klopp's system down better than Klopp does because the defence is much tighter, and it's proving really really effective in the championship. Certainly doing a good job, isn't it? And uh, it, as you say, if they if they were to carry on, I think a lot of people expect them to drop off, but they've been impressive. And you know, as you say, if if they can pull this off, I mean, it would just be the most incredible story. I, I would <clears> completely <throat> agree for the record that they will drop off. It, but yeah. we said that three, four, five, six times just in the in the three podcasts we did at the start of the year on whether Leicester would stay up there or not. And then we kind of realised that, okay, they're going to be here. So the, the thing with the championship is it's momentum. If you can keep momentum building and you can keep going, I say with the Football League in general, really, because there's so many games. If you can keep momentum going, then there's nothing that can stop you. And I remember Reading from a few seasons back when Slampton were in the, in the uh, in the championship Reading were sixth and they went on this incredible run where they just won and drew everything and they ended up taking the title off us even though we'd been first for about six or seven weeks and then Barnsley last season this this time last season Barnsley were about to start a game a nine game run without a win or nine defeats I think it was in the league and then they got on a bit of a roll and then they got promoted and now they're in the championship and they're doing quite well so if I just can keep it going then who's to say they can't do it yeah, absolutely. And we are going to um, we're going to splice a few questions in as we go because we've had a few questions in from uh, from our listeners, and uh, we have one on the, the Huddersfield Town uh, situation or uh, or setup, if you will. It's from our good friend Pete Kennelly, and he wants to know uh, what do you think of their strategy in uh, quote unquote loading their way to success. Uh, he speaks, of course, of some of the players that they've got in on short term deals to uh, to pad out their squad, if you will. Well, you can't say that it's not working. And that's that's the main thing. If it works, then fantastic. The only concern you would have is that it is a bit of a band aid sort of fix. You know, it's when when the loans run out, do Huddersfield have the money to then go out and replace them with permanent deals, or do they go back into the loan market? How do they work it afterwards? If they can do well this season, then then brilliant. It, it's done. It's done its job. But the concern isn't for me so much the short term; it's the long term. Once those go, once those guys go back to their parent clubs, how do they replace them? Can they replace them? And will they be a Premier League team by then? Because if they are, then they're going to have to replace them because that team without some of those loan signings isn't anywhere near Premier League quality. Yeah, I think that's a very fair answer. And as you say, it's the uh, the toughest part is when, once those players go back, if you have found yourself then promoted or indeed ready for another season of trying to get promoted, how do you sort of catapult on the form you had with those players when they're not around so uh, it will be interesting to see how they can manage that let's uh, have a look at some other clubs then uh, Norwich and Newcastle we'll, we'll kind of lump these in together because they're second and third respectively at the moment both expected to have good seasons having come down from the Premier League last season Newcastle had a, a wobbly start but have got progressively better and Norwich what's it four wins in the last five um, Alex Neal seems to be getting a tune out of them as well um who of these two do you, do you expect both to go back up automatically do you, do you think they're both performing to where they should be or, or what's your kind of views on both if i was to predict my championship table again i'd still have norwich and newcastle in the top two the question for me is only which one is going to win the title um and for me, I think the, the, the Norwich-Newcastle game from a couple of weeks ago where Norwich were leading 3-2 in the 90th minute and then lost 4-3 with two goals in the 94th and 95th minutes, I think that showed me that, that Norwich have got a lot more about them than perhaps people give them credit for. I think they are the Burnley of, of this year's championship. They're very well organised. They know who they are. They know how to get up and out. And they've got players that are now better experienced after being in the Premier League. So I've got no doubts that Norwich will go back up. And I think if I was to tip a champion, I would go for Norwich. Um, 
but that's a very, very close race between Norwich and Newcastle. And Newcastle, they just needed to get the tactics right. They just needed to change things up a bit and let the players bed in. You know, like you say, they had a very wobbly start, um, opening day defeat to Fulham. I can't remember who they went away to or lost to, but um, they, they didn't they didn't have the best opening. But they've certainly changed it around. They've tightened up at the back. Ten goals conceded is, is a pretty good record. 22 scored. So they're, they're a good sign to both of them. I think they've both got a little way to go just to stabilise themselves. And like I say, it's momentum. If you can get on another run, then absolutely brilliant. But um, yeah, I think I think they're both well positioned to go back up. I don't see any problems for either of them. It will just completely depend on who's um, got more in the tank to win the league. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a tough one to split, isn't it? Because they're two, two sides in very good form. And as you rightly say, big things expected, particularly of Newcastle, given the budget, the size of the fan base and all that. But so far, things seem to be progressing nicely for them. So we will keep an eye. Uh, I'm not having that Norwich third kit, by the way. I'm sorry. I'm just... Oh, I know the it's white a one that looks pink yeah. Flicky. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, I don't know whether you, cause you're a bit younger than me, Ross. I don't know if you remember when they first had this design. It was in the sort of mid 90s. I think they had the home kit was very similar when they went to buy Munich all those years ago. And uh, yeah, I'm not having it. Sorry, I'm, I'm just not having it. But that's enough about kits. Uh, let's uh, have a look at some other clubs here. Um, I'm kind of going to focus on clubs throughout different parts of the league, if you will. So we're not going to do this in order. I want to speak about Cardiff City next because they're all the way down the bottom end. They're actually second bottom, 23rd in the league. However, uh, the wind of change is is blowing through the streets of Cardiff. Um, as of an announcement of last week, uh, well, in fact, this week it was confirmed. What, um, what can you tell us, Ross, about this situation at Cardiff? Well, they hired... Uh, I think a, com- a former Cardiff boy in Paul Trollope to, to come in at the start of the season. Um, I don't think he'd ever managed in the championship before, if that, that rings a bell. Um, and I was very concerned for the appointment. I thought he'd been thrown in at the deep end. And then uh, then he came in and only managed to win two games in, in 11 games. Um, seven defeats now. It, it's, it wasn't looking good for him. Um, with, with the troubles that were going on at other clubs in the league, like Derby and Aston Villa, I don't think it's a massive shock that, uh, that Cardiff's owner, Vincent Tan, started thinking about his own managerial position um, and let Paul Trollope go and replaced him with a man that's retired three or four times now, Neil Warnock. Um, of course, Neil Warnock was in charge of Rotherham last season and Rotherham were in dire straits when he took over and he, they, he then kept them up. So I don't know if that's the reason he's gone to gone to um, Neil Warnock for, for this job, Vincent Tan. I don't know if he's just looking to keep them up. I don't know if he's looking to push them on. But Neil Warnock has said that he's got one more promotion in him and he wants it to be Cardiff. So interesting times ahead, but it's a strange situation there. I'm not really sure what I make of it at the moment. He uh, he spoke in his interview, didn't he, about... Uh, it's quite a good line, actually, used, where he said uh, he's always been popular in Cardiff, which is rare for him to the away fans, which I thought was a nice line. But, um, no, I mean, his, his credentials are there. You know, he's done it with Sheffield United before. Um, he's done it with... Uh, who was it? Crystal Palace he was at before, briefly. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the clubs he's been at. Um, Leeds, of Leeds. course, he had an unhappy spell. Um, you know, he, he knows what it is like to manage down there. So... You know, it might just yeah, be that's, a, that's the only thing I would say about it is that if you if you're going to change a manager during the season in the championship, you need to guarantee that the person coming in has experience because you cannot take a risk midway through a championship season because the the games come so quick and fast, and the manager has to adapt, the players has to adapt. It doesn't always work, and there's a lot of occasions where it's stalled slash gone backwards. The thing is with Neil Warnock, with Ian Holloway, even with Ian Dowie back in the day, is they were names that knew the championship, could come in, could do a job. And Neil Warnock is someone that can come in and will do a job, but it depends on depends on what they want from him. If they want to keep him up, brilliant, he'll, he'll get that done, I don't doubt that, but is he going to get them up? Uh, I'm cautious, especially with Vincent Tan. It, well, he, he says he's still committed to Cardiff, but it seems to be... The proof is the proof is in the pudding, and I don't think there's enough of it at the moment. He he seems very distant, you know. When when he first walked in, when he was in the Premier League, you couldn't get away from the name Vincent Tan. He was everywhere, and now in the Championship, he seems to have faded again. We don't know how much money he's putting in. I know he's wiped out a lot of, if not all of, their debt now. He's written it off, but we we, we don't really know what what kind of finances Neil Warnock's going to be working with at Cardiff. Um, stories that they're going to be signing Sol Bamber, the former Leeds captain, on a free. So. We, we don't really know what to make of Cardiff just yet. I think Neil Warnock is a fine appointment. He'll keep them up. But I don't think they're really real danger of going down. So it depends what the future ambition is. If he wants to get them up, then he needs to put his money where his mouth is. 
Yeah, I think some of the quotes coming out from him suggest that he would want them to at least make the playoffs. So, not asking for much, is he? Crikey. But we shall see. We'll keep a, keep an eye on that um, with Cardiff because they are potentially another one of those sleeping giants, um, which um, also brings us nicely into our next club I want to look at, which is Derby County. Um, now, there was some alleged uh, things going on with regards to their manager um, and still technically employed, I think, Nigel Pearson. Um, lots of rumours swirling about his conduct uh, towards the chairman, Mel Morris. Um, there's all sorts of things flying around the internet. Believe what you want to believe. Um, but as, as of recording, we gather he's still employed, but is he on gardening leave technically? Because Chris Powell seems to be at, the, at the, the helm right now. So what's your understanding and what is going wrong with Derby? Because everything at that club surely is set up for a Premier League push. Why do they keep failing? I don't know. If I did, I'd go get the job and I'd sort it out and earn millions. Um, the, the, the thing with the Nigel Pearson incident is, if you didn't know, there was an apparently a fight, either physical or verbal. We, we're not entirely sure which between Nigel Pearson and, and the chairman. Um, he's since been suspended. I think his assistant, Chris Powell, has now been in charge of two games in which they're undefeated. Um, but he's still technically employed. He's under investigation. But I've, I've never heard of a situation like this where the manager has stayed on. I, I don't see how he could. So we expect him to be sacked probably by the end of the uh, international break. Whether that comes off or not, we'll have to wait and see. If he does go, I suspect Chris Powell will then step in, unless they've already got someone else in mind. But Chris Powell is a Derby man through and through, and has done very well with them in the two games he's had in charge. Um, the, the issue for Derby this season has been... Scoring goals, um, keeping them out has been all right. They've they've only conceded ten, which is actually pretty good for this stage in the championship. But uh, they've only scored six, and they went on a couple of spells. I think two, three games in a row, once or twice, that they they just didn't get a goal. Um, I, I don't know what it is because Nigel Pearson is, is a good manager at championship level. You know, he got Leicester up, he kept Southampton up a couple of couple of years back. Now he, he knows this division, he knows how to get out of it. But for some reason, it's just not clicking up front for Derby. In the back, it, it's doing all right. They're, they're keeping clean sheets and keeping the goals out, but they just can't seem to score enough. So, so um, it, it is very concerning. And I think Nigel Pearson would have got it right given the time, but he seems to have blackballed himself now with this this alleged fight with his chairman. So. Interesting times for Derby. I, I don't think they're in any real trouble because there's just far too much talent in that side to be anywhere near the, the, the bottom three come the end of the year. But it depends on whether it's going to be Pearson or someone else. And I honestly don't think it will be Pearson because, like I say, I've never heard a manager coming back from a, from a suspension like this. No, it does. It does suggest sort of the point of no return, doesn't it? Um, it does sort of. It seems like it's an, only a matter of time before he is unceremoniously dumped. Um, we will, of course, keep across that, and I'm sure we'll tweet about it if if, it, if the inevitable happens. So stay tuned. Uh, right. So that's Derby dealt with. Let's move on to another club that um, are only just above them in the table, in fact, only one place technically, same points. Aston Villa. Now uh, they've parted company with Roberto Di Matteo. Um, I don't think that's a huge shock given their pretty poor start to the season. Lots of rumours swirling around who's going to replace him. Steve Bruce seems to be the front runner, former Birmingham manager Steve Bruce. So I think it's divided the Villa fans. Uh, who do you think is going to end up with a job and who do you think is the right person for it? Because again, surely Villa are a team that, I mean, they have to be pushing for promotion this season, surely. Well, they spent fifty million pounds on the on, on the squad over the summer, and they they have at this point a very good championship team. It's it's amazing that it's done so poorly this season. Only one win, seven draws, you know, only three defeats, which is relatively good for this point in the season. But you know, like I say, it's momentum. You you get on a drawing run, and suddenly you can't stop drawing in this division. You get on a winning run, and and it's the same deal. So I, I don't know what it is that went particularly wrong with Di Matteo. I've been um, following Aston Villa fans' reaction to, to Di Matteo for the past couple of weeks. Um, they they all seem to come up with the same word, which is clueless. Um, I've seen them play a couple of times, and I don't think I'd go that far, but there does seem a great lack of cohesion, as if it's more of a, a case of desperation that they need to be doing better, considering the money they've spent and the talent they've got. Um, as for the new manager, I fully expect it to be Steve Bruce, because it's quick, it's simple, they know what he can do, he's a very good manager. He can get them out of that division. Did it with Hull. Did it twice with Hull, actually. Um, and, you know, he's he's a very solid man that, that can get them up and keep them up. And he's also never really operated with the same kind of money that Aston Villa would offer him. So I think he could do it responsibly. I think he'd know 
what to do and how to handle that money. The other names mentioned, Dave Wagner of, of Huddersfield, um, the Brentford manager whose name suddenly escapes me, and Lee Johnson of Barnsley. The other one, and the one I quite like the sound of, and I know you'll agree, Chris, is good old Mick McCarthy of Ipswich uh-huh. Town. I think that would be a great move for Aston Villa because he's very pragmatic. I think Aston Villa needs to be playing a 4-4-2 with the talent they've bought. Get them playing a 4-4-2. Get them doing the simple things right. Get them a bit more aggressive. Start playing for the shirt a bit more. You'll get them up the division. And I think Mick McCarthy is the kind of guy that will spend prudently as well. He won't be throwing around 50 million like like Di Matteo did. So I'm all in for, for Mick McCarthy myself. But I think the obvious choice and the one that will probably end up there is Steve Bruce. I concur. I think Mick McCarthy has been quietly doing a brilliant job with Ipswich for many years. And I I do sort of get that feeling that he he's almost there waiting for somebody to offer him a good job to move on. I, I, I kind of I, I kind of hope that he get Ipswich up because Ipswich are a proper old fashioned club with, you know, good, good morals and uh, well run, etc. So I kind of hope that he sticks uh, sticks around. But yeah, I think I think you're right. It's a good fit. But do you not think Steve Bruce might maybe look at the England situation a bit? and Maybe not want to rush into a job? Yeah, that's the other the other side of the coin though with with Steve Bruce because we mentioned it on on the breakfast pod the other day is there maybe a bit more going on with Steve Bruce because the the England set up or the FA I should say they were right behind Steve Bruce a couple of months back when they were deciding between him and Sam Aldice um now Sam Aldice is gone they need a new manager but they haven't moved for Steve Bruce yet do we think Steve Bruce is going to be named in this telegraph sting yet is there is there maybe a reason he hasn't been approached we don't know. Is there a reason that Aston Villa haven't approached him yet? Because Di Matteo has been gone a week at this point. We don't know. Um, certainly interesting. Uh, you know, if he's if he's clean, and I hope he is, then England will probably be the choice he wants to make. Um, I think he's probably at the age where he wants to to go and do some some international management, and there'll always be club opportunities when you're done. You know, you look at Steve McLaren as as um as a as a well, what's the word I'm looking for? Example. That's what I'm looking for. So, you know, he's he's probably ready for the England job, ready to take it. But at the same time, if it doesn't come off, then Aston Villa is is a perfect place to go and carry on doing what you do best. Yeah, picking up and uh, going again, as it were. So once again, another one we will uh, keep an eye on. But uh, let's have a, another look at another team then. Um, we're going to come back down the bottom end in a minute, but I want to come back up to the top end. Um, Bristol City and Birmingham. I'm going to lump these two in together because they both sit next to each other on 20 points in fifth and sixth of the table. Is it a surprise that both uh, are having quietly good seasons? I mean, Birmingham uh, seem to be slowly turning turning things around over the past. They, they've been a, a club that's constantly underachieved, uh, but in, in a manager that they've got there, Gary Rowett, former favourite, he seems to be doing a good job there. Um, and Bristol City, like just really kind of quietly going about their business, and they've got this this young man who you've uh, you've highlighted, who's on loan from Chelsea, who seems to be making quite a name for himself. Yeah, Tammy Abraham, uh, 11 goals in 13 games. Very, very good. Um, as we know, Marcus Rashford has been moved back up to the, the England national team and Abraham is the one that's moved up from the under-19s to the under-21s to, to replace him there. So, big prospect. He's, um, his parent club is Chelsea. I don't know how many games he'll get at Chelsea, but considering the record he's already got in the championship, it's it's a great sign. To be honest, he's the reason they're there. Um, without Tammy Abraham, I don't know if they'd be anywhere near fifth. I'd probably put them somewhere else around 13th, 14th maybe. Um, massive, massive difference having Tammy Abraham in the side. And I think everyone would have predicted Bristol City around the relegation zone, even you know maybe around 15th at the highest. But because of Tammy Abraham, they've, they're suddenly a completely different prospect. Um, Birmingham City, though, it doesn't, doesn't surprise me to see them in the position they're in because they've always had the potential to be this kind of club that just grinds out results. Only one defeat all season, which is absolutely fantastic in 11 games in the championship. So th- they've always had that about them, especially under Gary Rowett and the way he just adds small bits at each window, you know, like the, like the Ipswich model. You just keep grinding away and picking up one person here and one person there and suddenly you've got a brilliant team growing. The thing that will separate Birmingham from teams like Bristol City is, of course, their their takeover isn't complete yet. I think that comes into effect on the 17th of October, if memory serves. And we don't know how much money is going to be pumped into that club yet, but you'd expect it to be more than they've got at the moment because it's new uh, Chinese investment. So come January, will they start spending? Will they have enough new targets to help push them on to the next level maybe you never know it depends now um, entirely what happens between now and the Christmas period and the and the winter window if they can keep going then who's to say they can't push on a bit higher come January 
Yeah, it's uh, again another club with, uh, or especially Birmingham's case, a club with a big, big reputation and uh, potentially should be higher up in the league, which uh, also nicely transitions into. I'll have a quick chat about. I'm going to rope three clubs into one here, so three and one. It's going to be a test for you. Uh, Leeds United, QPR, and Fulham. Now we know QPR have got some issues at the moment with the manager uh, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. There's obviously he was attached to this scandal. Um, seems like he's going to keep his job, but. It doesn't seem like it's gone down well, let's say that much. Um, Fulham, who, of course, I tipped for promotion, so we all know how that's going to end. Um, they're sort of, after a promising start, I think they've drawn three and lost two of the last five. So, yeah, not great for them. Um, and then Leeds, who, I mean, four wins out of the last five. They're one of the championship's form sides right now. But that said, they had a terrible start to the season. And, of course, we know what happens with Chilino and et cetera, et cetera. So of those three clubs, who's underachieving the most and who can turn the, the form around and may potentially get up this season, do you think? Well, Fulham are massively underachieving from, from how they started this season. They had an, a really, really great start, including, like I said earlier, that, um, that win over Newcastle on the opening day. Uh, but I, I remember Jokanovic saying after that game that Fulham were ready for Newcastle but not the season. And I think 11 games in, you're starting to see it because the, the run they've been on recently has been awful. The, um, the, the the goals seem to be drying up. They can't keep a clean sheet. It seems to be falling away quite quickly for Fulham. Um, and I'm hoping they can catch themselves. But I think Fulham are the kind of club that are being screwed over by the fact we've now scrapped the, the loan window. Because um, obviously that's, um, that's been scrapped this season. And I think Fulham are, are one of the ones that are suffering from it. Because if they could get in a couple of extra loans here or there, I think it could completely change their season. But um, hopefully they can address some of the issues in, in January. Queen's Park Rangers... 13th, I think, is roughly where I thought they'd be anyway. Jimmy Ford Hasselbank is a good manager, but he had a big job on at Queen's Park Rangers and readdressing the team, bringing in new signings to, to better adapt to his style of football. I, I just think they're going to get drowned out in, in this championship because there's just so many good clubs with a lot of settled teams and some very good managers around. So Hasselbank may be in a season or two if he's still there. I think, well, why not go for promotion? But this season, not for me. I think 13th is, is roughly where they'll be ending up as well. And Leeds, well... Certainly got some very good players at Leeds. Um, you know, there's this uh, Ronaldo Vieira is one of their youngsters who's going to have to be one hell of a player with a name like that. You know, they, they've got some very good players. I think um, Sacco is there as well. Is it Hady Sacco? I think that's his name. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he, I think he's, he's doing brilliantly for Leeds. Um, yeah, the, Leeds offset that really wobbly start. And it was all about whether or not Chilino would, would keep the faith, and he did. You know, there's managers like Dave Hockaday that didn't last even half the, the games that, that uh, Gary Monk went without a win. So the, the thing with Leeds, though, is, it, is it's all about how you did last weekend, you know, with the fans and with the with, with the chairman. Um, of course, Chilino's been, been mentioned in this uh, Telegraph scandal as well, Shock. saying that England was hugely corrupt and you know, this kind of stuff, and you know it's not a surprise to anyone. But how ironic coming from him! Of I know he's he's not going anywhere though, so he can say whatever he wants and he'll still keep that because the uh, the football association won't do anything about it. So yeah, it Leeds, like I say, it, it's all about what happened last weekend for Leeds, and at the moment it's going quite well, but it could all change very very quickly as we know. But I, I'd like to see Gary Mark succeed with Leeds. I think he's a very good manager. It's a very big club that deserves to be back up in the top ten. Um, they still have that season ticket promise. I think it was the season ticket promise to to keep where they said that if they weren't in the playoffs, at least they'd refund half the price of your season ticket or whatever the whatever the deal was. So a lot of pressure on Gary Monk, but he's turned it around. He's doing a good job for now. But like I say, it could all all change next weekend. Yeah, as it could with, with most teams, has to be said in the championship. But yeah, three to keep an eye on. Um, just on QPR, I don't know what it is, but I don't think Hasselbank's a good fit there. I, I don't, I don't have any reason behind that. I just something just doesn't fit for me. For me, I thought... he came in too early. Yeah, I thought, I thought he needed another job because the the Burton job he he had, he was building on the shoulders of Gary Rowett, who did a fantastic job with Burton, and even Gary Rowett was building on the shoulders of, of Nigel Clough and you know previous managers. There was oh, I can't think of the the Italian guy, I think it was there before him, but you know, the Burton have had a string of really good managers and they've got very good bones at that club. So when Jim Floyd Hasselbank came in and did a good job, that wasn't a shock to anyone. But, you know, he, he still needed more time. He hasn't had that many jobs yet. And for, for me, it's a, it's a very big project at Queen's Park Rangers because the, the ownership, obviously, have tried once at throwing money at the problem and see if we can get them up. They've been in the Premier League. They didn't last. They're now back down. They've had to completely clean the decks. So it, it's a big job. And I think he's maybe just come into it a little bit early. It's going to feel like his progress as a manager is stalling a bit. But 
give him time, and I hope that we'll give him time, I think he'll get them up and he'll get them out and he'll take a good stab at the Premier League. But for me, it was just a job that came a bit too early. Yeah, yeah. I, ironically, I thought Warnock was maybe the right person at QPR, but um, obviously that didn't end uh, particularly well for for those. Um, interesting, interesting. If you haven't ever seen the, I think it's the four year plan or five year plan, the documentary that Warnock was involved in with QPR a few years ago. Um, if you haven't seen that, particularly our overseas viewers might not have seen that. Do look it up. I think it's called the five year plan. Uh, really, really interesting documentary. Uh, so yes, do do that. Right, uh, Nottingham Forest. I want to talk about quickly as well. 18th in the table. Um, Philippe Montelier, big name manager, um, under huge pressure right now. There's the owners. Is it uh, is it Fawaz? I think it, it is. It is Fawaz. Um, who own the club? Obviously, they sold their star man in in their hipster's choice of the past, um, Mr. Burke. Um, Oliver Burke, who's now at Red Bull Leipzig, of course, and, and doing very well from all accounts. I, I'm getting in from there. What I mean, it's it's another club, isn't it? Another club that are a big quote unquote club. I hate saying big club because you're only as big as your current success. But you know what I mean. You know, former European Cup winners, all the history of club, etc. And there they are in 18th position in the championship. Three defeats from the last five. The other two were draws. Um, they've got Nicholas Bentner. I mean, shall I go on? Well, I, I don't think they've actually won since um, end of August, I think I remember. Um, and that was just when Ollie Burke left. And I'm, I'm not going to say it's all down to, to Oliver Burke leaving, but Oliver Burke scored four goals in his, his opening few games for, for Nottingham Forest, and he's still their joint top goal scorer. They haven't kept a clean sheet in any cup or league this season. You know, the 22 goals conceded so far in the championship alone. And the owner is still looking to sell up. You know, it's it, it's a messy situation now with, with Nottingham Forest where you have a club that still feels like it should be moving up the division. That's still got the finances and the players to move up the division. But you've got an owner that wants out players that are apparently, you know, not valuable enough to keep. I know Ollie Burke did a did an interview with the national newspaper. I can't think of which one now, but um, he was he, obviously he's called up to the to the Scotland squad and how well he's doing in, in Leipzig at the moment. And he said that he just didn't feel valued there and it seemed like Nottingham Forest were ready to take any offer above a certain amount. So he was he was ready to move on. You know, it, it feels like a club that's being run by someone that doesn't want to be there and that's that's never a good thing. Montagnier may just keep his job because of that. You know, you, you never know. Um, but he, he's still kind of improved the results on the pitch because it's not Fawaz that will sack him, it's the fans because they expect a lot better from, from the side they've got. At the same time, you can't say they've not been entertaining because 19 goals scored and 22 conceded is, is brilliant numbers if you're a neutral. But if you're a Nottingham Forest fan and you're used to all these messages of being near the top end, you're expecting a hell of a lot better. Yeah, massive amount. But as you say, it's a club with uh, another club with huge pressure, and um, like you say, it seems strange to see them underachieving as as big as they are, as as not high as they are, I suppose. Um, what about Reading as well? Let's touch on them briefly, because you were saying pre-record tonight that some of their fans are not particularly enamoured with the Yap Stam style, uh, which sounds like a really bad techno track. Um, but uh, they're sitting in eighth in the in the championship, so it's it's not a bad start to his tenure. I mean, they're only what seven points off the top. It, it's hardly it's hardly bad. But five wins, three draws, three defeats, uh, minus three goal difference. What is it? that is getting the ire of the uh, the Medeski fans sort of going. What 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 is the issue, do you think? Is it just the style? Yeah, it's, it, the, the complaints I've heard, because obviously I, I live in Southampton, so they also pop up on um, BBC South Today, which is our local coverage on, on the BBC. And Reading fans have been on there saying it's it's the slow pace, it, it's the possession, it's the, it's the defending, and it, it's not what they're used to in the Championship because this division is so gung-ho and balls to the wall and as many goals as you can get. Um uh, yeah, the, the the feeling amongst the Reading fans is is the 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 style isn't isn't setting in yet, um, but it's a it's a very Dutch style, you know. It's it's keep the ball, move the opponent around. As long as you've got the ball, then the opponent can't do any damage to you, sort of thing. But the the issue is you can't really control games in the Championship. If you do, you have to be a quality team like Newcastle, and even they've been struggling hugely to to control games this season. So. It's uh, I, I personally I think it's the right position for for Yapstam Reading. I think it's a very good platform to build on because you look at some of their previous managers like Brian McDermott, like Nigel Adkins. They've come in and they've done all right, but they've not done good enough. You know, they're certainly 
they're certainly managers that you would have expected them to have done better with. So I think Yap Stam has come in at a good moment. I think it's a, a good first job for him to, to settle into life in English football and in the championship. But there, there is apparently a bit of um, a bit of friction between he and the fans over the style. At the same time, you can't deny it if it works. And 11 games played and only three defeats isn't bad in the championship at all. And the, the main thing this early in the season is to be in and around the position you want to be in. You know, if, you, if you're trying to stay up, then right now you want to be 18th, 17th, 19th, that kind of area. If you want to go up, then you want to be 8th, 9th or 7th. You know, you want to be hanging around just long enough to get the legs ready for that final push at the end. And if Reading can stay there, then who says they can't do that? True. Yeah, very true. Very, very true. There's, there's, there's a few teams in and around that area where you, you look at and you wonder if fans are happy or not. I suppose our fans ever happy. That's the biggest question we have to answer. Um, right. I'm going to turn the podcast over to you at this point and just ask you, we've covered a few, quite a few teams there in, in, in a fair amount of, of detail. Is there anyone else or any other club that we haven't particularly covered that you want to give a little bit of a word for? Cool. Um, well, Rotherham. Uh, sinking like a stone. I'd, I'd like to see Alan Stubbs do do well with Rotherham, but only one win in eleven. They seem nailed on favourites for for relegation, which shouldn't surprise too many people. But it's still disappointing to see them struggle as much as they have. Blackburn. Um, I mean, we we all thought Blackburn were a bit of a a bit of a patchwork side, but I think it's caught everyone by surprise how poorly they've done. Twenty goals conceded is is awful for for a club like Blackburn, especially with Owen Coyle in charge, who, as we all know, was once tipped to be Arsenal manager. Um, Wigan haven't. Lit the, lit the world on fire but Will Grigg is still scoring a decent amount of goals but they just can't keep them out at the moment they can't seem to turn those goals into points um, aside from that you look at some other teams maybe Preston um, obviously they had uh, a hideous defeat to, to Burton, Al- uh, Burton Albion to, to Brentford they lost 5-0 I think it was 2-0 with 75 minutes gone and then the three they conceded were absolute jokes and since then They've gone on to, to win 1-0, draw 2-2 and win 2-0. Um, great turnaround and we shouldn't forget that 2-0 win was over Aston Villa. So they've um, quietly turned things around and they're another impressive team at the moment. But you know, like I say, that 5-0 to, to Brentford was, was a sign that they could absolutely capitulate any given week. Um, other than that, the only ones we haven't mentioned are teams like Ipswich, um, Sheffield Wednesday, Barnsley. All of which uh, are currently doing what I thought they would do, really. I think Sheffield Wednesday are a little bit unlucky to be outside of the top seven. They had that um, wobbly start with Forestier. Is he going? Is he staying? Thankfully, they've managed to sort of steady the ship, and hopefully they can build on that again going forward. Barnsley, um, very impressive going forward, but they seem to be fading a little bit now. 16 goals conceded. You know, you, you get a bad injury to one of those strikers that are doing so well, and suddenly Barnsley start tumbling and Ipswich with with Vic McCarthy you know we've already mentioned they don't have the world's biggest budget um the job that Vic McCarthy is doing there is is inspired he does, doesn't score the most but he doesn't concede the most it's a very steady club like I said earlier with with Burton um very good bones at that club and I would love to see them do do much better but this season I don't think it's for them there's there's far too many star names and star teams in this division for for them to really make an indent on the playoffs I think yeah it's uh it's it's shaping up, isn't it? It's shaping up this season to be well. It's it's already been surprising. Let's be honest. There's there's a lot of teams that I think both of you and I have well, we didn't predict would be up where they are and and are doing well. I suppose we should actually give some stats out, really, shouldn't we, with regards to uh, bits and bobs going on. Um, top goal scorer, as you mentioned, Tammy Abraham is top of the tree with uh, eight goals. Um, Dwight Gale is up there. We expected that, I suppose, after his money move, big money move to Newcastle. Um, Hogan is that Scott Hogan? Scott Hogan. Yeah. Scott Hogan for Brentford. He's up there. Um, a name not expected. Will Grigg, who's on fire, apparently. Uh, five five championship goals this season. He's he's not doing too bad for himself either. Um, who else? Looking down the list, as you say, Oliver Burke is still there on four, even though he's long since left. Um, and Jacob Murphy, one of the Murphy twins, is on that list as well. So a few decent names there. Uh, let's have a look at the assists. Connor Hurrahane is top of that with four. Uh, four assist player I've liked a lot actually for a while he was at Plymouth Argyle for a while good little player uh, Jordan Ayew is three for Aston Villa uh, good to see him out there Wes Houlihan for Norwich as is Johnny Halson for Norwich uh, is that Gary O'Neill for Bristol City I think it is yeah I believe so yes God bless him he's out there as well and uh, Tammy Abraham's got two himself so he's he is having a lovely old time and uh, everyone's favourite disciplinary list uh, just a couple of names here uh, Fisher of Rotherham uh, three yellows, one red already this season. Same for Baldock of Brighton. Uh, Sam Baldock, who's known a, for a tackle. There's a he? long list of people that are on three yellows and a red. 
Yes, there is actually, isn't there? I'm just looking down this rank now. There is a long, long list. Uh, Stevens of Brighton, so it's kind of Brighton players. Pereira of Forest, uh, Vandenberg of, of uh, Reading. Uh, crikey, lots of players. Um, and uh, Matt Connolly of Cardiff, he's up there on the list, as is Van La Parra. So, as is Gary O'Neill, funny enough. I mentioned it there, so there's plenty of plenty of names that we will know a little bit about, and I'm sure we'll remain on that list as the season progresses. But uh, there you go. Right now, before we leave the championship, um, a couple of games to look out for next week, because uh, obviously the season we're on international break at the moment. This is why we're recording this podcast, of course. But uh, have you got a game that you think is worth looking out for in the next round, or games if you I've prefer? I've got three that I've picked out for for the next weekend of games. Um, the first one is Friday night, and this it frustrates me hugely that there's a Friday night fixture because there's two games on Friday night. On the same night, I wanted to watch Leon versus Nice, so I've got three games to try and juggle. So it's going to be very tricky. But oh, um, my world. <laughs> I know the, um, the the one I've picked out for the championship on Friday night is, of course, um, Neil Warnock's first game in charge, which is at home to Bristol City. Um, should be a very interesting one because like I say Bristol City shouldn't really be where they are but it's all down to the goals Tammy Abraham scored and um, you know Neil Warnock has only had maybe what a week in charge to, to start changing things around at Cardiff so it's going to be very interesting to see how they do very interesting to see how Warnock um, lines up in his first game how he tries to address the Abraham problem um, the next weekend or the Saturday I should say you have uh, Derby County versus Leeds. Again, that should be very interesting, predominantly because of the managerial situation at Derby. We don't really know who's going to be in charge. Um, is Pearson still going to be suspended? Is Chris Powell going to be there? Is he going to be permanent manager? We don't know. But if um, Chris Powell is still there, then I don't know what the situation is backstage with, with training. I can only imagine that Nigel Pearson isn't allowed to be doing the training if he's suspended. But um, if, it's, if it's a Chris Powell team going into that game against Leeds, then I couldn't call it. Um, off the top of my head, it's it's a very very evenly matched game. If it's if it's Chris Powell taking that game, um, if it's anyone else, then then who knows what to expect from it. If Pearson's back, or even if there's a new manager in place, and then the other one I've picked out is Wigan versus Burton, predominantly because that should really be a relegation but kind of battle. Um, both of those teams are going to be looking for points from that game. Burton, like I say, they've they've been a bit hit and miss. They're starting to slide. They can't keep a clean sheet, etc. And Wigan, they they just. They, are hugely underperforming for, for the kind of club they are and the level of talent they've got in that squad. So that should be a very interesting fixture because if there is a three points there, then they could be absolutely huge come the end of the season. There's a lot of uh, a lot of big games. We did say pre-pod that we were going to have a look at maybe some games to look out for in the coming weeks, but there's just so many to to cover. It's difficult to do that. So um, we'll, we'll we'll wrap the end of the podcast with um, with some thoughts on teams for you to keep an eye on and watch. But we'll come back to that at the end before we uh, before we do end. We've we've got a few questions, and then we're going to do a little bit of League One and League Two as well, uh, which we'll hold our hands up. We're not as well versed on as the Championship, but we will do our best. So let's um, let's have a little bit of a breather with some questions while we're here um pete kenley uh, also wanted to ask his second question was about villa and he asks if steve bruce can fix them uh, and if not who can so you put your head on the block and you're saying you think bruce is the the choice they'll go for so do you think he can fix villa quote unquote i i uh, to be honest i think a lot of, of i think there's a lot of managers that could come in and do a good job with villa because i think all they really need to do is keep it simple. You know, if you play a 4-4-2 and you play McCormack and Codger, or Codger and Justed up front, you've got some decent players behind you, Adoma, Jednak, uh, Chester, Elphick. They've got the spine of a very good championship team. It just needs to be played properly. So Steve Bruce is a is the kind of pragmatic manager that would go in and get them playing good stuff. So I, I don't doubt he could quote unquote fix them and get them moving back up the league. But again, I think Mick McCarthy would just do that as well. You know, and he'd be a lot more savvy with the way he spends his money come January, uh, addressing the problems they have in the team. So I'm all for Mick McCarthy. But if, if it's Steve Bruce, then I have absolutely no doubt they'll be back near the top six by the end of the season because he's done it before with Hull on a, on a budget that was nowhere near as generous as Aston Villa with a squad that was nowhere near as good as Aston Villa's if, for, for the championship. So I don't think he'd be a bad choice. And if anything, I think he's... Um, push them back up into the top six this season yeah i'm with you i'm with you i think it's uh, it's definitely going to be uh interesting to see what happens there because they are fans that, that they're not 
the pa most patient. Um, again, I'll have to ask our good friend uh, Chris Bayliss, who's a Villa fan, follows us, um, what his thoughts are uh, when I've had a chance to read his blog, which we will be posting in the coming days. So um, that should be a good read if you're a Villa fan. Um, let's ask another question here. Uh, that one's about League Two, so I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, here's our good friend. Pigman J. Hankenstein. It's been a while, sir. Hope you are well. Um, he says, knowing how notoriously long the championship season is, what's the likelihood of Huddersfield making it to promotion this season? Now, we both said we kind of think at the moment they might fall away, but promotion is not necessarily winning the league. So what do you make of that question? Um, top six, I think, is doable for Huddersfield. Like I say, it, it depends on your momentum. If... I, I, I hope that Huddersfield aren't bringing themselves into the ground too early, you know, because I'd love to see them challenging for, for the top six. But um, it's really going to be whereabouts are they at Christmas time. If they're still up there, then who knows? They could have a very good January, bring in one or two more just to keep the legs fresh, get some more squad rotation in it, and they could carry on. But if they're starting to fade away by, by Christmas time, then they're going to be in the almighty scrap that comes around every single season when you get six games left and there's still three teams that can make sixth. So they are well-placed. This start could be the thing that keeps them in the in, in the hunt. Um, like I say, it's, it's all about momentum in, in this division. If you can keep it going, then nothing stops you. And certainly Huddersfield have, have ridden the early season momentum. If they can carry it on and they can get into Christmas still inside the top two, maybe even inside the top four, then then who knows? Yeah, it's doable, isn't it? So, I, yeah, I, I must admit, I, I like to see new teams come up. Uh, if for nothing else, just something different. I don't know. That's probably just me being a fan of a, a big club. But I like to go to new places and experience new crowds and, and whatnot. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all behind the Huddersfield idea, particularly teams that don't wear red because there's too many teams wearing red in the Premier League at the moment. Uh, let's have another serious question. Uh, now, uh, continuous precarity. Uh, precarity um sent us in a couple of questions here um i think you might have misread the uh the question slightly because he sent us quite a few questions that are probably for our main pod really but he has managed to sandwich in one which is definitely relevant which is about benitez and newcastle uh, he says your thoughts on them so far and indeed chances of promotion this season what do you uh well you've touched on them already but maybe drill down a bit deeper into the newcastle uh, situation currently oh i still think they're nailed on for, for promotion um the money they've spent, the players they've bought in, they've got great squad depth now. It's um, it's it's a brilliant team at championship level, and it should be sweeping this league away. But because it's the championship and it's so scrappy, it's not going to be able to to finish 10 points clear or something like that, I don't think. So I, I still have them as favourites to go up with, with Norwich, but it will just be a question of whether they can really start to kick into gear, maybe get a couple more results like they got at uh, QPR where they won 6-0. You can get a few more of those, then maybe you can claw over Norwich, but I think Norwich are just a bit too pragmatic, which I don't think Newcastle are. I think they're a bit too um, bit too flash, you know, which is which is what slowed them down at the start of the season. They've toughened up, they've settled into, into the formation, into the rhythm, and they look a lot better now, but um, I still think they're trying to play their way out of the championship rather than just get out of it like Norwich will be. So I, I like Newcastle. Um, very good bones there, very good structure, and hopefully they can take it back up into the into the Premier League and build on it. But you know, like I say, they they still strike me as a team that will very easily get out of this league. But I, I just don't see them finishing first at the moment from from what I've seen early doors. They they just seem to have that softer underbay that I don't see with Norwich. You know, and you can call that into question because of the four three if you want. But when you watch them game after game, I I just think Norwich are are a better 11, you know, they're a better squad than, than Newcastle are, but that's not to say, like I say, that, um, that they can't just turn on the style and sweep these teams away, because they, they really should be, especially the teams near the bottom, but you look at, um, they went away to, to Rotherham last weekend now, and we thought that was going to be an absolute pasting, considering Rotherham have only won one game all season, and Newcastle really, really struggled, you know, Rotherham gave them a hell of a game, um, whereas Norwich turn up at those kind of places and just churn out the result when it's 2-0 and it looks very comfortable, so... I, I think Newcastle were a dead cert, but for the title, I still go with Norwich at the moment. Fair enough, yeah, fair enough. And uh, Newcastle fans, you can rest easy because at least on my FIFA game, uh, myself and, and Alex Hunter have fired you top of the championship. So it's all good because we all know that in real life, FIFA is all that matters. So don't worry, it will all be OK in the morning. Right, uh, let's um, just touch briefly on League One and League Two, then, Ross, before we uh, before we sort of wrap things up. So, uh, League One, 
uh it's it's quite competitive much like the championship really in fact let's be honest league one and league two are both competitive but what what's um if anything what's the standout that you've noticed in league one teams that are overperforming underperforming you've got some big names in in this league who who are you sort of tipping for a good season and we will touch on a couple of teams individually i think in a minute because there's some quite big stories going around but your thoughts on the league as a whole first of all I've always liked League One because it's it's like the Championship light. You know, you, you go down to League One and it's still hugely competitive. There's just not as much quality in in League One. But um, I, I always like to keep an eye on League One because obviously the winners come up into into my favourite league. So it's it's always important to know what's happening. Um, a very difficult early doors to know which teams are going to be staying where they are because Sheffield United had an absolutely awful start to the season and now they're up in fourth but they still have the potential to have another awful run and fall back down the league again so it's difficult to know if they're going to be there Scunthorpe and Bradford are currently the top two and I would never have guessed that a month of Sundays if you'd asked me the start of the season so are they going to stay there? I don't know you know it's a it's a distinct possibility, but you know all, all the big names, all the really big, talented clubs that we thought would be there are, are sinking. You, know, you think of MK Dons, who came down from the Championship. They've been in League One for years, and they're ninth. You know they're they're quite um quite lower down than you would have expected them to be. Bolton Wanderers started really really well. Um, it's Phil Parkinson that's in charge there now. And suddenly they're down in seventh, uh, eighth, sorry. And then you look a bit further down and you look at Charlton Athletic, who are now in, in 18th, six draws and three defeats in their first 11 games. And then you look in the bottom three and there's there's Coventry, you know, and all of those clubs should be much higher in the division than they actually are. So it's um, it, it's very difficult to know early doors. With the championship, there are trends setting in, but League One, I'm still waiting for half of those teams to drop off and half of those teams to spring into life. Yeah, it's very uber competitive. And um, there's just two clubs I want to focus on individually in this league. Um, let's, let's just start with Coventry. Um, I mean, what, what do you make of what's going on there? They're having the training ground potentially sold off to a rugby club. Um, there's the issues with the owners in that the fans have come out now and said, you know, they want the owners to go. Um, the manager, or oh, quickly his name escapes me, stepped down. Um, Tony Mowbray. Tony Mowbray, that's the badger. Um, he stepped down, um, essentially sort of just holding his hands up, saying, look, I've, I've tried my very best, but I just can't I just can't do anything with this club. It, it's sad, isn't it? Because they are one of the founder members of of, of the, um, well, I think, the Premier League era in particular. You know, Dion Dublin's, the John Salako's, the Peter and Love, Steve Grizovich days. You know, they were a proper, proper club, a big Midlands club. and And now... Well, I mean, it's just it's hard to know because I, I've even heard people saying uh, as a gentleman who's written a book who forgive me, I can't remember his name, but um, he was saying that there is a, a real danger. This club could go out of business. I mean, it, it, it's it's really sad, isn't it? Yeah, we thought those problems were behind it as well. You know, a couple of seasons ago, they were playing their home games in Northampton. Um, they moved back home and we thought, you know, it was all going to be all going to be rosy. We thought it was going to turn around, but it's um, it, it's a shame to see them get thrown back into into the mire. I've I've always seen Coventry as a championship club because when I got into football in like the early 2000s, maybe even the the mid 2000s, that's where they were. I don't remember ever seeing them in the Premier League, but I've always known them to be a quote unquote sleeping giant. You know, they they've always struck me as a as a club that only needed one good manager or one good takeover or whatever it may be to really kick them into gear. And now it just seems they they can't can't buy a win. They they can't buy a good manager. They can't buy a, a steady ownership. And it's it's really sad to, to see Coventry in the position they're in. But at the same time. I'm still of the opinion that if they can get someone in that, that knows this division, they can at least stay up, and, and that's the first battle one. But um, a lot more problems than what's going on on the pitch. Yeah, sad times indeed, uh, definitely. I'll we'll keep an eye on them. And the other club I wanted to focus on was Bristol Rovers, um, because would it be fair to say they are massively overperforming? Every time I seem to see them, they seem to be you know, either in a game or winning a game. They seem to be doing really, really well for a club that were... You know, unceremoniously dumped down the bottom end of the leagues the last few seasons, seem to be making a resurgence um, in a big place like Bristol, where City are obviously excelling at the moment, and Rovers are not far behind. So, is it is there potential to have a Bristol Rovers sized club in the Championship next season? Do you think? Yeah, of course there is. We've had Yeovil win there before. Um, the, the thing with Bristol Rovers is that 
it was seemed like only yesterday to a lot of people that they were getting relegated to the National League. And you'll still remember the scenes of, of the fans running onto the pitch and, and the tears and the um, the, the quote-unquote rights. I can't think of the actual word I'm looking for, but there, there was a lot of upset when they went down. And, you know, it was always felt that a club like Bristol Rovers shouldn't be anywhere near the, the bottom end of League 2, let alone getting relegated. And yet, here they are now, 7th in League 1. You know, it seems like a, a, a blink of the eye ago they, they were down in the National League. So the, the turnaround there has been fantastic the the work the squad's done the management the ownership they've turned it around extremely quickly um quicker than i thought anyone thought they would and seventh in league one is a fantastic platform could they go up i i wouldn't tip them for it just yet i think it's been a very good start but i still need to see a bit more from them a bit more consistently across the the rest of the season but there's no reason they couldn't get into that playoffs so once you're in there, then who knows? It was Barnsley last season. Like I said at the start of the pod, Barnsley went on a run last season where they didn't win in nine. And they got on a bit of a run, and they got in the playoffs. And as long as you're in it, you're in with a shot. And they ended up going up in, in, in the playoff finals. So Bristol Rovers could do it, but there's, there's nothing stopping them. But it's a, um, a long road to home. Great start, but it's still to see a little bit more from them. It's a cliche, but uh, as you say, anyone gets on a run, anything can happen. So that's what they've got to keep believing. OK, uh, let's finish up with League Two then, because, again, uh, some fairly high profile sides. Um, some of our, our overseas listeners might not be familiar, but if you uh, if you look down this this league table, as I'm looking down it in front of me now, uh, look at the likes of we'll, we'll touch on Plymouth Argyle in a minute. It's got a question there. We look at Portsmouth, you look at Luton Town, Crew Alexandra. Uh, Hartlepool, Wickham, Blackpool, who, of course, people will remember were a Premier League side not so many years ago. Um, Exeter City, Oval, as you said, previous championship side. Barnet have come back out of the Football League to go back into this league. Lake Norian are down there at, at, towards the bottom, actually. Grimsby as well. There's a lot of big sides. Anyone really taken your, your fancy or when you've watched highlights or, or heard sort of forums and whatnot? Is, is there any teams that have really impressed you this season? Or, or maybe at the other end of the spectrum, teams that really under impressed and they're struggling at the moment oh Exeter City that's an easy one for, for teams that aren't doing as well Exeter City under Paul Tisdale I think he's been there six seven eight years now and he's consistently been a very good manager for them top end of league two middle end of, of league one kind of manager he struggled before and he's he's always kept them going he's always managed to, to turn them around but the start they've made is awful and it, it's strange to see them down in the in the relegation zone so Exeter City are, are by far and away the most disappointing one so far this season but um, for me, the one that's been quietly impressive in League Two has been Carlisle United. Um, the, the, the manager's name escapes me now, but I can see his face. Keith Carl, that's who it is. Keith Carl was in charge at Carlisle. And when he first came in, it was mainly his job to keep them up and, and steer them away from the bottom end. And now, 11 games in, they're undefeated this season. Seven draws, four wins, up in third. They have been quietly impressive in a league, which is... Not exactly devoid of, of talent, but certainly it's uh, it's a lot rarer to find it in League 2, because League 2 is mainly made up of loan signings and players that are coming towards the end of their careers. You don't often see too many 25, 27-year-olds that are still playing at a very good, consistent level in League 2. So to, to see a club like um, to, to, yeah, to see a club like Carlisle back up into third, really starting to... Um, to, to hit some form I think that's great for Carlisle you know they're, they're a club I remember distinctly from from League One um, no one likes being in the same division as Carlisle especially if you're Plymouth Argyle so it would be it would be nice to see Carlisle go up but you just know Sod's Law Plymouth will go up with them yeah, well, we had a question actually on Plymouth. Um, for those of you listening in the UK, you might not be aware, but I'm actually based in Plymouth. I'm not from here, but I'm, uh, I'm dwelling here at the moment. Have been would you ever do Carlisle years. away? Uh, personally, I wouldn't, know. <laughs> um, well, I say that. I mean, I might, for Arsenal, I mean, I, again, it's no secret I'm an Arsenal fan. Um, for for a, t- a club that I just sort of follow because they're on my doorstep, I've I got to be honest, I don't think I would. But yeah, I do right, know man. many friends. It is, yeah. I, I know many friends who have done it. Um, I've got quite a few friends that do Hartlepool away on a regular basis as well. Uh, Die Hard Greens. So, um you know, a bit of a, a shout out to them, definitely. Um, but they're having a good season, aren't they, Argyle? We we did have a question actually from uh, our good friend Tom Douglas, um, who I think, for memory, I think Tom is based down here. I'm sure he is. If he's not, then I apologise, but I think he is. Um, but uh, he wanted to ask about them, and he said, uh, "Will Plymouth Argyle's form continue, or will they drop off like last season?" Hashtag only one Argyle. Love it. Um, 
what do you make of Argyle? Because this year it seems to be a bit of a role reversal. They they started quite slowly, um, and now they've they've kicked into top gear. They've got uh, top of the league plus nine goal difference, twenty five points, which is five points clear at the top of League Two ahead of uh, Doncaster Rovers. I knew you said League Two then. Sorry, uh, um, they lost in midweek in the um, EFL Trophy. I don't think they'll care too much about that. Good squad. Um, mixture of experience and uh, and youth as well probably one of the best players in league two in, in graham carey what what do you make of them at the moment i i really like lewis you know i've, I've said before I, i've always seen them as a championship club and i was disappointed when they didn't go up last season i um would have loved to have seen them come back up into league one uh I, I can't i can't think of how long they've been down in league two now but it seems far 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 too long for a club like plymouth I think um, it's three three seasons now. I think it is. I think. Yeah, for me, they should have come straight back up. But you know, there was a lot of you know, ownership problems and financial problems and such. But um, yeah, just just as a club, I would have expected them to have gone up years ago. The thing is, this season with them is, I will compare them until the very last day with Portsmouth, who are another club that really shouldn't be down there. Um, every season they start out thinking this is our year, we're going to go back up, and now they're down in sixth. They just haven't been able to click this season. Um, there's, all, there's always a turnover of players and managers at Portsmouth, at least has been the past few seasons. This year, though, it, it kind of felt like Portsmouth would be ready to, to go again after the, after the playoff problems and ready to get back into into first gear. And they, they just haven't. And um, Plymouth have. You know, They were in the exact same boat as, as Portsmouth. I think the thing that Plymouth have in their favour is they've been there, done that. You know, They've, they've missed out on the playoffs before now. Um, they're probably just as pissed off of being down there as, as most of their fan base are. So... I think Plymouth are in a much better position than many other teams in that division, for, for absolutely sure. And uh, if I was going to predict my, my top three, because obviously the, the top three go up in, in League Two, I would have Plymouth in it, if not as champions, then second. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate of Plymouth. I think they're a, a, a very good club. Um, my only away day as a fan was at Plymouth, so they, they do have a special place in my heart. I'd love to see them come back up. But um, for the rest of the season, I think the thing Plymouth is to compare them to Portsmouth because they were in the exact same situation last season. Both um, both big clubs for, for League Two level. And uh, one of them seems to be sailing and the other seems to be sinking i like that nice naval analogy there uh yeah it is uh they play each other actually in in two weeks time uh 15th of, of october port uh, plymouth hosting portsmouth so that'll be worth uh worth a watch i think what is it they they christen that derby what is it the uh oh the dockyard derby dockyard derby that's it yes it's um, not as I bad would... as el Clasico, which is apparently the portsmouth southampton derby that one reminds <laughs> me up goodness me yeah that's that's different um yes uh, sky sometimes get coverage of that so if they do have a look out for it although i don't expect them to it's down as a three o'clock saturday at the moment so i would guess not but uh maybe look it up if, if you get the opportunity and yeah i'll go do it doing very well and doing the uh, doing the city proud i think there's a lot of people that are very pleased i know that they're looking at expanding the famous old home park um i think argyle are the i think they're the, they're the only argyle aren't they in, in english football I think I'm right in saying. That surprise me. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Arg is the only Argyle in British football. So there you go. And uh, Derek Adams, um, former guest of ours uh, on the pod, uh, Ali Beg, his uh, his best mate Derek Adams in charge there, former Aberdeen player, and by all accounts doing a pretty good job. Pretty good job indeed. Okay, right. So that uh, kind of sums up League Two for us nicely then. So uh, here comes the point where I say to you, Ross, any other business, uh, anything else you'd like to bring up? Um, and then I'll, uh, of course, ask you for a few teams to keep an eye on. So anything else you want to in- involve our listeners in, any other news or anything you, you think is relevant at this part of the season that we're uh, broadcasting, which, of course, for anyone listening in the future, we're, uh, we're recording this on the 7th of October. So uh, any, anything else you want to bring up at this stage? Mm, not that I can think of, except to remind everyone that the the football league is just as, if not more, exciting than the Premier League at times. So if if you're not following, especially the Championship, I know it's my favourite league, but the Championship just has so much happening every single weekend. If you haven't been following it, if you haven't decided to sit down and watch a couple of games, absolutely give it a try, because you, you just never know. Um, and I'm sure that the Championship can convince more than just a couple of people that uh, it's well worth keeping an eye on and um, and following. So, yeah, if, if you haven't already, my advice would just be to to start watching some more lower league stuff, and if you can even get to one of your local lower league teams. 
Yes, absolutely. That's one thing we do definitely encourage uh, on this podcast, and, and and indeed anywhere. I mean, if you, if you support a local side, I mean, you know, I, by my own admission, I don't go to nearly enough Argyle games, and unfortunately, as recent years, the price hasn't helped that. But uh, if it's affordable and it's on your doorstep or within a sort of you know short journey or by car, by train, by by foot, whatever it may be, just just get involved and see some local teams and especially with the amount of big teams down in the lower leagues at the moment, you know, you get an opportunity to see these clubs. It's, it's good. And, and who knows, you might see the star of the future. Um, as you said earlier on with Oliver Burke, Ross, I mean, who'd have thought where he could have come from? And of course you remember the likes of or Gareth Bale coming through the ranks at Spurs. And before he came to Spurs, he was on had a couple of loans to me and uh, to David Beckham famously at Preston once upon a time. So who knows, you might see the, uh, the star of the future. Um, if you go and watch some local leagues so, so please do get involved and if you do and uh, and you go to a team you've never watched before or you start following a team you've never watched before let us know just uh, give us a tweet or a, a message or give us a comment on YouTube whatever it may be and just let us know about the teams you follow because it's it's how we uh, how we grow our listenership and how we can spread our uh, our followers and get people interacting in different leagues so it's always good to uh, always good to do Right. Uh, so before we leave then, Ross, um, this is uh, your opportunity just to tell us a few clubs that you think we should be watching, because there's a lot out there, uh, whether it be Championship or League One or League Two. Who are the teams that you're going to be keeping an eye on in the coming months before we hit that busy Christmas period and why? Um, well, the three I picked out for the Championship would be Huddersfield, Wolves and Villa. Um, I think they're relatively obvious choices for the championship because obviously we we spoke about Huddersfield. Like I say, if if they go up, it, it's it's the Leicester City of the championship. So they are obviously you want to keep your eye on. Wolves have obviously got the new takeover with Walter Zenger in charge as well. Um, be interesting to see how they do in the build up to the January window, where they have another month to spend another x amount of million pounds on more Portuguese players. But they are quietly doing relatively well at Wolverhampton Wanderers, and they could. Um, very easily explode any minute and, and really take the championship by storm. And then obviously you've got Aston Villa, who um, you know we, we've already covered the, the managerial issues they've had, the, um, the possibility of Steve Bruce coming in. Um, like I say, I think he could do a very good job there. And, and if he does come in, then it could be a complete turnaround to Aston Villa. So another one to watch. Um, for League One, I think Charlton are a very fascinating club because they should be nowhere near the position they're in. And you'd expect them at some point to turn around. I do like the look of Walsall. Um, I think they lost their top seven goal scorers over the summer. I can't think of what the figure is off the top of my head now. But they're doing quietly well. I know they're 16th, but they're still doing quite well for the, the sheer amount of talent they lost. So they're always a fun one to keep an eye on. Um, and then obviously you've got clubs like Coventry, MK Dons, Bolton, like we say, Bristol Rovers. There's a lot of clubs that um, that could be moving and shaking over the course of the season. And come Christmas time, the, um, the League One table especially could look extremely different to what it does now. And then uh, if you look down into League Two, obviously we have to mention uh, Plymouth, who, like uh, like Chris and I were saying, I think are, are great favourites to, to go back up this season. But uh, Exeter City needs to turn things around. Hopefully they can do before Christmas, because if they're still in it by Christmas, the League Two... Um, the League Two table normally divides around the Christmas period into like a bottom five, and then you get one or two maybe changing across the rest of the season. So let's um, let's hope if you're an Exeter fan that you're not in there at that point, because I think it would be a real shame to see Exeter City, or uh, more more appropriately, Paul Tisdale and his amazing sense of style be anywhere near the bottom end of League Two. Um, Blackpool, obviously, we know former Premier League side have had their monetary problems, but hopefully they can um, they can turn things around. The other one I tip in uh, League Two would be Leighton Orient. I can't think of the name of the guy that's just taken over now but um, we mentioned it on last week's pod the former Fiorentina manager and Brescia manager and you know all these clubs that he's managed in Italy he's now down there with uh, with Leighton Orient so that's uh, a very interesting project because clearly like I say if you're managing in League 2 then you can't have been that good in Serie A but at the same time it's uh, it's a very interesting story you don't get too many former Fiorentina managers in League 2 so um, he's got a big job on his hands but I'll be very interested to see how he does Yes, I'm uh, frantically looking it up because I remember the guy's. I remember the guy's uh, name. I can't, it's tip of my tongue as well. Uh, Alberto Cavarsin. That's the one. There you go. Uh, so yes, as you rightly say, former former uh, Fiorentina manager. But again, as you also say, didn't exactly have the best of time in Syria. So uh, yeah, happy one to keep an eye on. I I will just give you. I, I appreciate I've sprung this on you rather. But is there any players that you because you you've, you already you called on the Oli Burke thing. Um, there's a few others. Is there any players, particularly in the championship, that are really exciting you, or that, that you're really keeping an eye on right now? 
there's loads in the championship to keep your eye on. Um, Hildeberta Pereira of Nottingham Forest, who is, as we know, top of the, uh, or at least joint top of the disciplinary standings. He's he's a great player, but uh, he's got a, a horrible petulant streak that's getting him into trouble. Um, Ronaldo Vieira at Leeds is also one to watch. Um, Hadi Sacco, uh, there's Ola John at Wolves, there's both the Murphy brothers at, at Norwich. Um, there's Adam Armstrong at Barnsley. If you haven't seen the two goals that he scored so far in this championship, oh my, they've been very good quality. Uh, you would highly recommend going and finding them if you can. There's there's loads, loads and loads and loads of great talent in, in the championship. Um, lower down the leagues gets a bit blurrier for me because I don't know them as well. But uh, but certainly in the championship, there's there's always someone impressive in nearly every side. Yeah, there's plenty of teams or plenty of players uh, to to keep an eye on, and and we will of course keep an eye on them. And if if you think of anybody else for us that that might be worthy of a hipster's choice, perhaps one week, then uh, throw them my way. I'm sure we can get that involved as well. So, good stuff. Okay, right. Um, that will bring us to an end then of this uh, this interview. It seems weird when I interview you because I speak to you every week, so it seems odd. But I think we've um, we're planning to do a few of these, aren't we, throughout the season? Maybe during some international breaks or when we just get a quiet period, because it's nice to keep our listeners in touch with the championship and and the leagues below. So just people have got an idea of where these big teams are and gives people a chance to ask us these questions as well. So uh, yes, do do keep it tuned to ourselves, and we will of course we we carry on like Ross said earlier on the pod. We do we do cover the um the championship in particular as well as league one and league two in the english breakfast each week so if you do like what we've done with this interview and you like some of the things you've heard or some of the opinions that have been uh, been voiced then we will uh, we will return to these on a sunday night and uh, let you know how things are going uh, we might even have a live spot at some point for a podcast to take some live questions so stay tuned and i should say at this point as well if you are a fan of a team in the championship or below and you want to have a chat to us uh, whether it be myself whether it be ross whether it be both of us um or whether you just want to write for it write to us please do um drop us a, a line at the fh podcast on twitter you can email us the football hips podcast at gmail.com um you can contact us any way you like really and uh, we will be very happy to have an interview with you if you're ha- if you're comfortable speaking we'll, we'll record something if you just want to put your thoughts in paper as indeed chris bayless has done as we mentioned earlier on um, please do we will feature your work and don't worry you don't have to be a professional blogger or a professional podcaster because uh, either even ross and i are not that so uh, if you want to have your say and let people know about your passion for your club then, then please let us know we'd be happy to have you right ross uh, speaking of happy to have you thank you very much for your time this evening it's a pleasure as always yeah pleasure as ever i am off to find a bag of ice for my head i've had a headache all day and i just need to to lie down now Oh, see, that's commitment. You've had a headache all day, and I've got yet another head cold. So, but we, but we were here. We weren't going to let our listeners down. So uh, that's commitment for you. Uh, right. As I say, do check out the previous content that we have available. Do check out Tom's interview with uh, with John Driscoll, the Spanish expert. If you haven't already, that will be up by the time you hear this. Uh, check out our latest podcast. You can find all our work, as I say, at the FH Podcast. We are on YouTube. We're on SoundCloud. We're on iTunes. We're all over the place. You can uh, download us anytime you like. Uh, give us a little thumbs up on YouTube or give us an iTunes review if you like what we do Uh, your feedback is appreciated but uh, that's it for us today we will of course return and uh, we have been the Football Hipsters keep your beard strong and your glasses trendy keep enjoying your football and hey the international break it will soon be over and we'll be back to normal we'll speak to you very soon (laughs) 